Thank you, Marilyn. And thanks, of course, to the organizers of this conference for the pleasure and the very great privilege of being asked to speak here. And I'm sure this conference will be sort of exciting and productive. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, in all kinds of ways. I mean, for me, maybe of the many profits I hope to derive from it, the most important will be that it will give uh, many of us coming from various countries of the global south to engage with each other in a way that you know, we rather uh, sort of shockingly and depressingly often do not do, and that this might help also to open up more channels in the future, as well as, of course, those via London, which I hope will again not only continue but grow. Um, okay. I suppose the slightly curious title of my paper is explained by the fact that I myself am literally a Southpaw, so it seemed an appropriate uh, pun. Uh, there are two points uh, I would impress on you before I begin uh, reading the paper. One is that necessarily um, what I'll be talking about will be focused on my experiences in my own country, which is India. And many of uh, the points and suggestions I make may not apply equally to other countries of the global south, but I hope that they will all be sort of broadly relevant across the board. Secondly, and this is important, by the south, the global south, uh, in this context, I'm talking about the academic and publishing community that is physically located in the south. What I say will not apply, in fact it may often be opposite to what would apply, to people who might originate from that area but who are currently located in the global north. Okay. Um, so, I mean, let me sort of formally begin the paper by again thanking and congratulating the organizers of this conference, because conferences bringing together publishers, archivists, librarians, and academics, all of these groups, uh, to discuss knowledge production and access from a common platform are rare, and to have, have, have such a conference focus on the global south is virtually unknown. Now, the sad truth, of course, is that except in certain niche areas, geographically defined as a rule, academic publishing in the global south is a feeble presence in the international scene. And I'm glad of this chance to explore ways to prevent the situation from continuing indefinitely. Uh, needless to say, in any discussion in this field, we have to address the interests of the reader, or shall I say the consumer, as well as the author or provider, besides the publisher or manufacturer. I mean, I'm putting these in sort of um, uh, quite openly commercial terms because that actually is how, in practice, academic publishing, like any other form of uh, activity involving money, and virtually all forms of activity do involve money, alas, uh, how it's bound to function. Um, all academic authors, one hopes, are readers too, but the opposite does not apply. And as I would shortly suggest, the interests of the two groups, the author and the reader, can be opposed to each other in the global south in ways that do not apply to the global north. But first, the chief problem facing readers in the global south, the obvious one of costs and of funds to meet those costs. Virtually all academic publications in print and digital mode, uh, which circulate internationally, are sourced from the north and priced accordingly. This is not to deny that authorities in the South can be even more parsimonious in funding both physical and electronic libraries than their limited resources justify. Also, they have, on the whole, a poor record of resource sharing schemes, shared libraries, pooled subscriptions to digital resources, or resource sharing consortiums spanning cities and nations. It is remarkable how much good has been done, even by the limited, though in Indian terms substantial, resources offered by the InflibNet program, rather clumsily named, that is a great program, Information Library Network uh, of the University Grants Commission of India. But given the best possible planning and funding, it is out of the question that any nation of the global south can provide its universities with a fraction of the electronic let alone physical resources of even second-ranking institutions in the North. I'm sorry to say this, but that is a sad truth. As I know from experience, any proposal for differential pricing by international e-journal and database providers is not even given a hearing, let alone implemented. 
Disappointingly, resources created even by some non-profit trusts, I won't name any, uh, also prove often to be restricted on variable terms, even when there are no copyright constraints. We are now being offered what, I must say, frankly, I consider and which my colleagues consider uh, the very doubtful panacea of open access publishing which would in any case apply only to journals and other new publications and not archival databases. So this is the catch-22 situation that I hinted at earlier. Open access to such resources, if not precluded in unsuspected ways by the small print, might make it easier for scholars in the global south to carry out research at international levels, but it will make it even harder for them to publish the results of that research in international fora. I would like to use my time uh, on other more constructive issues. So on the subject of open access, I will content my, myself by saying that in my view, like that of the sadly small numbers on, of scholars in the South on whom the matter has registered, open access will only perpetuate, if not increase, the current imbalance in research productivity and publication between North and South. Emerging young scholars from the South might be even better trained than the best of them are already by accessing these resources openly, as it were. But to fulfill the higher career potential that they thereby acquire, they would be even more likely than now to flock to the north for the opportunity to publish and establish their careers. Hence the first major point I would like to make. We cannot separate the demands of access and publication, but we nor can we assume that they will go together or tend in the same direction. The one might well flourish at the expense of the other. Uh, in fact, in the very short time since I wrote this paper, uh, I've been having other discussions with various people, bringing out various other problems with the system of open access, but I won't even touch on them now. I'll just continue with what there is in my paper. We have to take special care to program the demands of access and publication of the author and the reader uh, to coordinate the two. As, but there are two separate processes that have to be linked in a planned way so that they can be mutually productive. It will not follow as a matter of course. I would therefore like to devote the rest of my time to exploring ways in which the South can fend for itself, drawing on its own resources. I would make only one appeal to academic bodies in the North that may stand some chance of success. Please, at least, release your non-copyright digital resources for free access via the internet. To the limited extent to which this has happened already, augmented by the rather poor subscription-based resources that institutes in the South can pay for, this has already brought about a, at least a limited revolution in the approach and productivity even of our undergraduates. But this is only whetting appetites that we then cannot satisfy in the South. This is what I meant by saying that merely improving, uh, that by merely improving the present dispensation, we also increase its inherent imbalance. The South simply ends up providing better recruits for the research order of the North. So what are the positive options open to the South? First and foremost, we can greatly improve our digital profile by creating online databases of our own archives and cultural material. To date, our output in this field covers only a fraction of the material. This is not due solely to lack of funds and emphatically not to knowledge of technological know-how. It is because the culture of digital access and preservation is still unpopular or simply unfamiliar among large sections of our academic and conservation circles. This is not to deny that much has been done. And again, I can only talk not even of my entire country, it's a big country, but only of my part of it. Uh, we have moved a long, a long way since the time that the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, created a major database of early Bengali journals, but was unable either to host the site themselves or to find an Indian partner or sponsor. Heidelberg University had to come to the rescue, hosting the material to create the nucleus of its resource site, Savipa Dock, now subsumed in the Cross-Asia Repository. Some later archives created by the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, like those created by my own School of Cultural Texts and Records at Jadavpur University in Calcutta, in Kolkata, uh, were sponsored and are now hosted 
by the endangered archives program of the British Empire, uh, of the British Library. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Freudian slip, but no. This is a Freudian slip that works by negative. This has been an extremely fruitful interaction, which we are very happy to hope will continue. <laughs> Sorry, how can I make up for that here? But anyway, on a far bigger scale, there is now an immense ongoing government-funded enterprise, the Digital Library of India, the DLI, with a declared goal of nothing less, this seems much too much, I quote from their own website, digitizing all the significant works of humankind. <laughs> Actually, it says mankind, which is wrong. You have to get this. Uh, the DLI already offers over 187 billion pages of digitized material. That is more than a drop in the ocean, but it's still just a few bucketfuls. To set up a proper pipeline, as it were, the entire structure and organization of the DLI needs to be overhauled and its funding incrementally enhanced. India's National Manuscripts Mission has done an admirable job of recording and describing ancient manuscript holdings across India, but only at metadata level though there are plans for the program of full digitization. A similar mission for printed books is urgently needed, but has yet to materialize. Mm. These are obviously matters to be discussed in other forums within India. We have to make our own way forward here. Meanwhile, some smaller institutions are digitizing and uploading their own holdings. In my part of India, for instance, the DSpace online repository of the West Bengal State Central Library Network. But other major institutions continue to keep their holdings offline even when they have been digitized. The Rabindra Bhavan at Vishwabharati, for instance, or the unsuspected <laughs> 600,000 pages of digitized material with another 500,000 pages in the pipeline prepared by the Bongyo Shaita Parishad, the Bengali Literary Academy in Kolkata. Uh, the Tagore holdings at Rabindra Bhavan are now almost entirely available on the Bichitra online Tagore site brought up by my university. Now, these are examples from my state. I do not know and I have no way of knowing what work of this sort might have been carried out in other parts of my own country. I do know that the Raja Ram Mohan Roy Library Foundation, the government of India's apex body for overseeing the nation's libraries and archives, has funded extensive digitization of material in many major holdings, and so has the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts in Delhi. But most of this material remains offline with the disturbing possibility of the digital records being altogether lost through file corruption or simply physical misplacement or neglect. At the same time, in those rare cases where sporadic digitization projects are being coordinated, a coherent body of digitized material is taking shape that might be integrated into a database. Within my experience, the various sallies at digitizing early Bengali printed books uh, to which the British Library's new initiative to cover another 200,000 pages of its own holdings will be an invaluable contribution, are starting to add up to the possibility of an integrated early Bengali books online, using my colleague Obhijit Gupta, who is here and will be speaking later, using his Bengali short title catalog as bibliographical control. You will note that I have made no mention of corporate funding. India's large corporate houses, which by now have a perceptible global presence, have been sadly unforthcoming in supporting such projects or indeed any academic activity in Indian universities, even while they make very generous donations to wealthy institutions in the West. So what could have been a transforming agent for cultural archiving and its online dissemination in India has virtually not come into being. This is especially disheartening as there is no dearth of skilled manpower, actual or potential. Obviously for the routine work of archiving, but also for creating specific programs and the unsuspected intricacies of backroom file management. Of the three programs we had to write for Bichitra, and here, sorry, excuse, half a minute of, sort of um, collective self-advertisement, there's a book <laughs> out on the Bichitra to go online project. It's just out, it appeared last week. There's a specimen copy out there in the foyer uh, brought out by uh, Springer Vedlag, uh, which describes these processes in detail. <laughs> so we had to write three programs um, which are, to the best of our knowledge, the first text analysis programs developed for initial use with non-Latin fonts. One was created by an MPhil student of our university, another by two undergraduates, 
and the third, a complex three-tier collation program by a young temporary lecturer, a PhD student, and a fresh graduate in the distance mode. I mean, the human resources are there, but they need to be coordinated and they need support. We need the cementing awareness that will generate funding and ensure online presence of scholarly and cultural material from the South on an appropriate scale. Archival databases do not constitute formal publication, but they create the conditions for publication. They mark the first step or several steps towards the electronic edition. In fact, the Tagore Online Vario and Bichitra, it began in a proposal for digital groundwork towards the chronologically arranged print edition of Tagore's works, which is just beginning to appear from another source, another institution. One could think of a species of crowdsourcing already tried out non-electronically at certain Indian universities, whereby students from master's to PhD level or junior or even senior academics carry out a program to edit a nation's textual heritage with a simultaneous program of basic translation. In fact, the translation is the more difficult proposition by far. It would inevitably have to rely on machine translation. Hence, adequate corpus building and data analysis must be a matter of priority to enable the development of even the rudimentary translation engine. As of now, to the best of my knowledge, no Indian language even has a workable electronic lexicon, digital lexicon. In other words, we need a very substantial input from computer scientists and programmers, as well as computational linguists, working in harness with textual scholars to create the technical support system for a comprehensive range of accessible and to some extent pre-analyzed primary material. It's an immense task, but notionally doable, as frankly it is not, at least not on an India-sized scale, in the print medium. And once done, it would provide an open-ended template for endless such operations in the future. This task cannot be carried out exclusively by external institutions or a nation's own diaspora. Locally-based scholars have to play the pivotal role, even in the rare instances where there is a substantial, even unique, store of material abroad, as most notably, perhaps, in the Oriental and India office collections of the British Library. Mm. Here, the British Library's proposed partnership with Jadavpur University and the Srishti Institute can, we hope, provide a model for a series of such future projects. In the vast majority of cases, however, the material is located in the countries concerned. And there, a more viable and flexible model would be the British Library's Endangered Archives program. I mean, we are having this discussion at the most appropriate venue in the world, really. I mean, a different way in which I think the bottom of the world's knowledge can come true. In an imperfect world governed by an academic and cultural hierarchy, no less than an economic one, the sheer authority and prestige of such programs creates support within the concerned countries for more such exercises funded by local resources. Such engagement by public institutions in the North is imperative for another vital reason, to forestall the appropriation of Southern material by commercial data providers. The South Asia archive, being brought out by Taylor and Francis, is a major resource in the making. But the more Southern material that we place on such platforms, to be accessed on the same terms as all northern subscription databases, the more we destroy the chance of southern scholarship from ever engaging on equal terms with the northern, even with respect to the material of its own civilizations. It is also unnecessary, as southern material can be accessed and digitized much more cheaply locally, owing to the cost advantage in those countries for such labor-intensive work. It is not as though large infusions of corporate financing are imperative, as they arguably might be for material from the great repositories of the North. So the idea, as I see it, is to create a substantial body of Southern material to feed the North's laudable appetite for scholarship in such fields, which could then form the basis of an exchange with the North's own material from sources at present inaccessible to the South for economic or institutional reasons. It would enable the South to look the North in the eye, as it were. In the international knowledge scene, virtually all studies concerning the South are currently, in some sense or other, a niche concern. 
or to, to change metaphors to a more depressing one, a backwater. They need to be brought into the mainstream. And I believe, I'm sure most of us would agree, that digital technology, properly apply, applied and pervade, can play a more productive part than most other forces in moving towards, I don't say bringing into being by itself, this desirable and not entirely impossible dream. There is a song by Rabindranath Tagore that says, do not ask with empty hands what you should ask for from the fullness of your being. I would not be misunderstood. In the global intellectual order, the scales are heavily weighted against the South for historical reasons not easily reversed. For scholars physically located in the South to engage sustainably with the international academic order, let alone win recognition there, means crossing barriers that are virtually unimaginable to those located in the North, or even people from the South who moved across to the North. Many capable scholars in the South decide early on that is simply not worth the game, that they can lead equally fulfilling and less stressful lives by making a different set of choices within the confines of their own society and their own intellectual community. I use the word confines advisedly because, of course, they lose out, as does the rest of the world. We cannot hope for a magic formula to stamp out the iniquities of the geopolitical and geocultural orders. We can only think of practicable strategies to come to terms with it. And the course that I have outlined appears to me a possible one. I have designedly less left time. Uh, the chairman, uh, chairperson will be happy to hear. But, uh, I've gone through a little over two thirds of my paper. Um, deliberately so. I've left less time to talk about publishing in the conventional sense, the production of articles and monographs, the province of the book and the journal. Here we have to negotiate a double hegemony of the North over the South, as always, but also no less of the printed book over the electronic. In the sciences, the electronic journal may have effectively supplanted the print version, and even, though I'm told not entirely, the preprint. But in the humanities and social sciences, the exclusively electronic journal lives very much in the shadow of the print journal, even if the print version, even if those journals are largely read in electronic format, and the print versions have become, for that reason, even more utterly uneconomical and unnecessary. It is not a matter of funding and logistics where the e-journal hands, wins hands down, but of prestige and acceptance. How to free the e-journal, and still more, the digitally born monograph from the status of also ran or residual legacy is perhaps the biggest challenge for academic publishing in the 21st century. What makes most sense in practical terms, above all in terms of costing and circulation that are otherwise considered paramount, uh, clashes with the entrenched, almost epistemic conventions of most disciplines. If all publication were in digital form, we could obviously publish much more, many times more. The objection, not a light one by any means, is that it's so easy to upload something digitally that this would be at the cost of quality, even perhaps with loss to the defining ethos of the discipline. No less bizarrely, to use a charitable adverb, the costing of e-journals is wildly disproportionate to the subscriptions demanded, especially seeing as contributors and reviewers commonly receive no payment and increasingly provide the copy in LaTeX or other ready-to-upload form. I need not exp expand on this generally known problem, but we seem no nearer a material, a material solution. The best-funded universities of the global north are now you know, finding it hard to meet the, the costs involved. To the lay eye, the marketing strategy of, let us say, open book publishers offers a promising model for volume length publications. As far as journal publication is concerned, we could mull the possibility of an exclusively digital platform with strong peer review by experts of undoubted eminence, not necessarily from the country hosting the journal. Um, efforts have been made to set up free entry, free access e-journals where such experts would actually contribute so as to lend them the highest credibility. But such efforts have not made much impact. It may e be easier to engage experts at this top level um, as honorary editors or reviewers rather than actual contributors. 
I'm also relying on the utter, the utter Catholicity and open access in the literal sense of the internet itself. That is the bright side of its undiscriminating nature, so rightly vilified in other contexts. One can assume that once placed on the internet, sooner rather than later, genuinely valuable research will attract meaningful attention from the international academic community, come within the charmed circle of high profile acceptance and register proportionately on Scopus and other citation indices. This possibility of random access is something that print publication and still more the closed world of preprint circulation among scientific institutes simply does not allow. You have to go to the library to look at the book, uh, physically go, whereas you can access anything on the internet anywhere. This is also another of the innumerable arguments for a sustained worldwide campaign for service providers to maintain total content neutrality, a debate which recently flared up in my own country last month. This is, dies down temporarily. Weighted and selective content packages would almost certainly exclude the kind of open platform that I'm talking about, spelling its death in the cradle. Ultimately, again, this seems like a wild dream, I'm thinking of an alternative knowledge order. Alternative. I'm not suggesting for a moment that it will replace the dominant order, but it might modify it or at least place it in a different global context. Even as an, even as an ancillary, my alternative proposal may appear an unreal scenario, were it not that in an utterly different context of technology and logistics, it flourishes in my country, or at least in certain corners of it. That is one of the forces that keep us going, despite the unequally weighted global order and the no less innumerable local impediments in our path. I mean, I hope I've not given the impression of uh, uh, taking an entirely the standpoint of a, a victim, because that is emph emphatically not so. In the standard academic scenario derived from the West, a more or less delimited community, however great in number, of scholars and ancillary professionals study a demarcated amount of material. By demarcated, I do not mean that such studies cannot be interdisciplinary. In fact, all significant inquiry redraws the boundaries of the disciplines. But without getting lost in a Foucauldian maze, I can say that the total scope of all interdisciplinary studies, that is to say all studies really, um, is still contained within certain external bounds of academic praxis with its institutional and methodological uh, compulsions. It is, it is and is getting increasingly every year campus-based, institution-based. You either belong to this setup or you don't. Instead, the model I am proposing involves a wider social sharing in the materials of knowledge through the participation of informed or even not so informed members of the greater cultural community. <laughs> The nearest, ready practice in Ang the nearest ready parallel in Anglophone practice may be drawn from the Victorian age. The print culture of several Indian language communities, Malayalam, Bengali, or Marathi for a start, is constructed on some variety of this model. Its most tangible manifestation is surely the Kolkata Book Fair, where it's a poor day that does not have at least 30 or 40,000 visitors, sometimes going up to 100,000 a day. Only a fraction of them professional academics, or even students. In such a milieu, the world of the non-professional serious reader, the amateur scholar in the non-pejorative sense, the amateur, the person who does something because he loves it, or she loves it. The world of the non-professional serious reader grades into that of, the pro of professional academic scholarship. The internet offers a platform for a new intellectual community formed on these lines. It allows for the possibility of crowdsourcing, of which one major hitherto undreamt of direction is indicated by the Wikipedia and by Wikiculture generally. Another could be the electronic compiling and editing of archival material on a wider scale than hitherto, as I suggested earlier, in a kind of updated version of the exercise that, again in the Victorian age, produced the Oxford English Dictionary. The chief disadvantage of such an exercise and such a culture is this less happily amateur aspect, namely its amateurish aspect, a lack of scholarly exactitude, let alone standardization of practice. But digitization necessarily calls for 
some detailing and quantifying imperatives. So necessarily, this discipline will be imposed on all participants in this new age pursuit of knowledge as a communal engagement. Six years into my retirement, I can claim to have acquired the right to dream dreams rather than see visions in terms of the biblical formula. But I will claim that in certain situations, the only practical recourse is to dream. Do you see what I mean? If we surrender to reality, we will never get anything done that's worth doing. I do not think any amount of mere tinkering with the global academic order, which is itself a minor offshoot of the global economic and political order, will materially alter North-South relations in scholarship and publishing. We must think of a differently constituted, differently oriented knowledge order of wider scope. I have been given my chance to bid for such an order at the start of this conference, but I leave it to the remaining speakers to do so more fruitfully and by proposing more practical strategies over the next two days. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shukantra. I think that's a, a fantastic start to the conference. And I think um, this um, uh, sort of uh, impetus for us to dream dreams might be um, a little motto that, that we take through the conference. Let's dream big these two days and let's, let's, let's push beyond the boundaries. Um, I was particularly interested in some of the, um, the remarks that, that Shukanta made. I thought it was particularly interesting, uh, your point, that, that, yeah, that colleagues uh, it, it, within the Global South don't always speak to each other, let alone have these dialogues um, with the North. So that might be a, a, a point that we want to take up. And another point that struck me was um, the whole thing about commercial providers um, actually uh, engaging with, with non-copyright materials and then making access to, to these prohibitively expensive. That is not just a southern problem. Um, I think we, we all come up against these, these providers who, who buy up huge swathes of library material and then charge, charge the earth for it. So that's a, a couple of points that, that really struck me. But this isn't about, about me speaking. It's about um, you being able to engage in this conversation. So lots and lots of interesting points. Do we have the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you put your hands up and then wait for the microphone to... Um, to arrive with you. Uh, over there? As far as possible away from you, Marcel. <laughs> no, oh, okay, great. <laughs> and uh, could you uh, say who you are um, and wh wh where you're from um, at the beginning of your question? Hello? Yes. Yes, excellent. Uh, hello, I'm Rosanna Cantabella from the University of Valencia in Spain. I must say, first of all, that I'm delighted to be here and uh, willing to learn a lot from uh, all the speakers because, well, we in Spain have reverted to a southern condition that we had <laughs> of old because of the economic crisis that goes and sees. So we have to make do without uh, grants, especially in the humanities and social sciences. So my question for uh, Choduri, who uh, has been so clear in the uh, Indian panorama and how they are doing there, is uh, could you uh, please amplify a bit about these reticences of uh, Indian scholars uh, uh, to publishing in uh, electronic journals that I cannot, under, we cannot understand very well because electronic journals uh, are being our salvation in Spain. We, uh, for example, I'm, I'm the editor of one of these and uh, we make do with zero uh, euros in budget. We all, uh, we make all ourselves because of our university, um, implemented the open journal systems platform, which is, as you know, open source. So uh, at zero budget, we are doing a lot. Of course, we had to learn a lot about what the uh, indexing ag agencies valued most and uh, conform to that. But I'm sure that uh, this is an idea that many Indian um, 
university uh, members had to. So why not more um, engaging with uh, economic journals in India? That was my question. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Um, my response to that would be, to, first of all, because print is possible to bring out print journals more cheaply. Um, the the impetus for electronic publication is that much the less, but that's not the real answer. The real answer is that there are a number of electronic journals, a good number, which are coming out from within India. Um, one almost feels like saying that most of them remain mercifully unknown because they're meant to cater to the need for you know, young academics to publish to you know, get a permanent job, but, I mean, to meet the needs of what we call the API, the Academic Performance in Index. See. And as a result, these journals do not command very high credibility in the academic world. And indeed, in some of them you have to pay to publish. It's the same, it's a sort of uh, a different version of the open access system. So what we do need, I think, is a different set of journals which... Um, where, which would really be peer-reviewed by international panels. And these journals need not necessarily appear from within India or any other particular country. But it would be a good idea, maybe, if using the international interaction that uh, so many Indian scholars do have, um, such journals could be set up by Indian universities. Uh, we need to get ahead with that. That is, in fact, one of the, the ideas that I've... Uh, tried to put forward very briefly in my paper because you know we have to do things ourselves if we want to change this situation we can't rely for things to happen from outside or from across the oceans good morning um, my name is Shamil Jeppy from the University of Cape Town thank you very much for the very interesting talk and uh, insight into what's happening in in South Asia indeed it's a great opportunity for us to connect as uh, as people from the south um, at the heart of the Empire. <laughs> uh, um, I, I just wanted to know uh, this digital um, humanities and uh, publishing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all the things connected with that is, of course, um, premise on the fact that you have enough bandwidth and um, good electricity supply. I mean, this is something that we've been suffering from in South Africa in the last couple of years. Um, so breaks in electricity supply. I may as well go to a northern library um, than wait for something to download from a northern library. It's just so <laughs> pitifully slow. And this, so I wonder what the situation is in India. So that whilst I theoretically know these things are available, it's just not worth my while. It takes up so much time. And then finally... Um, the archiving of these things. You've mentioned some of these projects that just <coughs> hit uh, a wall and then you don't know where they are. Then some five, ten years down the line, a new project gets started and mm -hmm. you get to reinvent the wheel. And this, uh, we, we know about this. So I, I don't know how you uh, can address some of these questions. Uh, Mel, to take your second question first, uh, I mean, we can only address these issues, I think, by more awareness of uh, digital culture. Because, it, I mean, uh, well, if in South Africa I've got as far as reinventing the wheel by archiving the same thing twice, well, you're you know, miles ahead of what happens in most other places when things don't get archived even once, <laughs> I think. And uh, there are huge uh, uh, swathes of material left unarchived, or if they have been archived, offline, so people don't know about them. Um, there's desperate need for... Uh, some kind of integrated program for which in my country uh, possible coordinators might be the Indian National Library or the Raja Ram Mohan Rai Library Foundation, you know, which looks after these things. But any major university could also do it. Again, this is another of the ideas that I float. I mean, obviously, the proper place to float these ideas, and we do float them there, and my colleague Obhijit Gupta floats them even more than I do, uh, is within India. So, uh, to take your first question about the electric, electric, supply of electricity, well, I think our experience, I think in at least the even second or third level uh, cities and towns of India, is that while bandwidth is you know, not as good as uh, 
it is in most Western countries. So I'm, uh, I was reading in the Times the day before yesterday that uh, there are some outlying villages, but the bandwidth is, I think, something like uh, you know, two kilobytes per second or something like that. Uh, but in a general way, it is slower, but it's adequate. Okay, I mean, certainly uh, it works out much faster and miles cheaper than having to make your way to London if you could, in other respects, to uh, anywhere else to look at the material, if it's available in the, in the north at all. Yes, hello, it's my Osama Reis uh, from Sudan. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to comment on uh, some points. Number one is, how do we look to the south? What is south? We have to define it, a new definition. Uh, how do we look to the south? We want to integrate or we want to study the south? I believe we would like to integrate south, north, and uh, nobody can work alone. As an example, to, to meet you, I was just in, in India. We did, like I'm coming now from India. Oh. Uh, we haven't met in India, we met in London here. So the issue of working alone or demarking south, north, I don't think it works for the future. Uh, even uh, having the uh, older look of south, uh, nowadays uh, uh, there are people from the south who are very active and uh, producing knowledge, while there are people in the north who are not active. Uh, so again, we need to define uh, how we look at the future. Uh, the future, uh, most of the uh, foresighting studies, uh, by 2020, more than half the world is uh, expected to be connected. Uh, not a bad connection, but a good connection. And uh, then again, looking at the future, we will de redefine the South again. Uh, I think uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel of, uh, of doing uh, islands and small pieces of uh, publishing houses and journals and we need to integrate with, truly integrate. And this uh, is from the south and from the north. People should be engaged in, um, as an example, professional bodies, IEEE, I'm, I'm from computer area, and uh, IEEE as an example, or uh, uh, previously, the, or the ACM here in, in, in uh, the, sorry, the, the British Computing uh, 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 Society are all over the world, with chapters all over the world. So we need to redefine them, not being American or British or uh, uh, French. We need to redefine them to be global players. Uh, the last issue I would like to mention is uh, digital transformation. Sorry? Digital transformation. So when we speak about the book of the future, uh, then uh, we need to look also at the societies and uh, institutions which are, and, and individuals who are using this book of the future. Are they uh, now in a process of transformation, digital transformation? And if they are, uh, any digital transformation should take care of uh, cloud computing, social networking, mobility, and analytics. And here I would like also to highlight the issue is you said about natural language processing. Because uh, active future would involve uh, many languages and uh, knowledge uh, will be expressed in different platforms and, and languages. So automatic translations and these issues are quite vital for the future. Thank you. Thank you. 
certainly raised a lot of issues, very <laughs> fundamental <laughs> issues, many of that things relating to the basic sort of philosophy of uh, digital computing as a whole, not just uh, you know, electronic publishing or electronic databases, so on. And, uh, you know, honestly, I would not undertake to return even some kind of <laughs> tentative uh, reply to all of them. Um, just to, I mean, may I just sort of consolidate my thoughts as I was listening to what you were saying into a single response, which is that obviously the underlying issues are very deep and uh, you know, very widespread, and even the supposedly southern issues affect the north and vice versa. But if you are going to make a kind of practical start, then unfortunately we might have to start by you know, trying to create some islands and hope that they link up into a continent in course of time. See, by specific projects of even digital archiving, of image-level archiving in the first instance, which is a huge amount to do, uh, to do, practically all of it undone, in fact. And if such projects were taken up with either funding from within the country or from outside the country, or both ideally, in the various countries of the South, that, uh, this would become part of the general uh, sort of culture, knowledge culture uh, of the South then but it is already moving in that direction. I mean, again, I don't want to sound too hopeless or too patronizing. Uh, how can I be patronizing towards countries, including my own? But um, then gradually, the tools, you know, various programs, uh, not just the accommodation of uh, programs created in the North, primarily with the Roman, with the Latin font in mind, but completely new programs uh, suited to various languages of the South, which are, of course, completely different from each other, yeah. uh, or other kinds of programs, programs of text analysis, of the analysis of textual corpora, all these would, I think, develop in course of time. Uh, but the, we need to accept the electronic medium as, uh, if not the primary, at least as a primary medium for the, the dissemination and exchange of knowledge to an extent which I feel has not happened yet in the South. Um, my name is Sinead Murphy and I'm at King's. Um, and thank you so much for such a compelling talk. Um, I was really struck by what you were saying about the costing of uh, journals and the disproportion between the kind of subscriptions requested with the costing of those journals. I think that's an issue we probably all have a similar opinion on. Um, and it, it reminded me of something that Franco Moretti actually said when he was here at King's a few months ago about the obstacle that presents to kind of work in the digital humanities at an institutional level. Kind of pretty startling statistics about um, how few universities can actually afford these subscriptions going forward. Um, and I was wondering if you had time to maybe say a little bit more about your uh, views on open access in that light um, and how you saw kind of the relationship of inequality between the global north and south um, and how you saw that maybe going, um, especially with some bigger journals maybe considering going to open access. Um, so it's kind of a vague question, but I was really interested in your thoughts on it. Um, I, w I wonder if this, that isn't rather too big a question, uh, yeah, seeing as we want to move on. I think, I, think, I mean, I, I flagged open access and some of the things that Shukanta said about open access as a key issue, and maybe we could take that up in the panel discussion later, because obviously uh, open access is fundamental to what we're doing. So I think that's a great question, but I think yeah, we'll yeah, park yeah. it for the moment, if that's okay. So I'd just like to thank Shukanta for getting off to us off to the most fantastic start. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.